Join us as we celebrate the amazing women working to understand and better protect the world around us. Hear from the women at the forefront of zoology and conservation with a series of talks for International Women's Day. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Juliet Vickery. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, if I block the view for you over here, just kind of wave your arms at me. Um, and um, I am head of a team of international scientists at the Royal Society for Protection of Birds. Um, some of you may have heard of them. Some of you may be members. If you're not, I hope you might be at the end of my talk, but that's another, another thing. So what I want to do is take you away from the cold streets of Cambridge to the heat and the humidity of tropical West Africa. And more specifically, uh, to a forest called Gola, which sits here. This is West Africa on the border between Sierra Leone and Liberia. Now, this forest is one of the last bits of what we call um, Upper Guinea forest that's left in West Africa. This is what it looks like when you fly over it. And it's home to the most amazing wildlife. So the forest floor is littered with beautiful and bizarre plants and fungi. This is a, called a net mushroom. Looks beautiful, smells terrible. Um, and uh, it's also home to amazing moths and butterflies, reptiles and amphibians. This is called a dotted reed frog. And the canopy is alive with all sorts of bird species, which I'll talk more about later, but also lots of species of monkey. This is a Western black and white colobus monkey. Uh, and also some fantastic bats. This is a big fruit bat. And the RSPB has worked with its partner organisations in this country for over 30 years to protect this forest and the wildlife that lives in it and the people that live alongside it. So I'm going to take you on a journey that starts in 1988, so 30 years ago, with a small expedition to look for this bird, which is called the white-necked picothartes, or jungle rockfowl. Quite a bizarre bird, I think you can see, and it nests in colonies on big boulders within the forest. So the first expedition went out in 1988 to look for this bird to a forest that very few people knew about. And now if you move forward to the current day, all the work that's been done in that time has resulted in this forest becoming the second national park in the country. So it's protected now in that country. And it's recognised its contribution to wildlife, but also uh, to helping in climate change. And what I want to show you is how science has helped that journey from an unknown forest to a protected and recognised one around the world. Now, the first thing to tell you about working somewhere that's really accessible, like Gola, is it's tough. So if I say to you tropical West Africa, you might think about blue skies and a nice gentle heat. Well, there are blue skies, but the heat is really intense and it's very humid. So imagine working in a sauna. And it also rains a lot. And that means trying to get to your site is very difficult. So here is uh, how our vehicles spend a lot of their time. So you often are pushing the cars, not riding in them. When you get to the field site, uh, where you live is not really very luxurious. So this is a temporary field base being built for some field work out there. And getting around your site takes a lot of determination and quite a bit of imagination. So these are some of the scientists working out there collecting data in the field. So it's quite tough to work there. And what makes it worse is that the animals that you're really interested in, the really rare ones and the special ones, are very secretive and often nocturnal. So you can't just go out and count them. So instead, we use camera traps. So these are exactly what they sound, really. They're cameras which you fix to trees, uh, and they're triggered automatically when an animal goes past. This is what they look like. They're locked in place, so they're secure. And every time an animal passes, it takes a picture. Um, but it also takes a picture of leaves that fall off the trees and of grass that blow in the wind. So we have about 150,000 pictures, of which lots of them are blanks. Lots of them are what we call near misses. So here's a little diker having a look at the camera. Some of them obviously offered real entertainment to local children. So here's some kids who like it. We've got a few with bare bottoms, but I thought I'd better not show those. Um, but the ones that aren't blanks or selfies have the most amazing pictures of what would otherwise be very secretive wildlife. So you have forest elephants. These are very small elephants live in the forest. Pygmy hippos, which are exactly what it sounds, tiny little hippos, uh, very hard to see. And chimpanzees. So um, we've used all these camera traps 
and some more traditional sorts of survey techniques to try and estimate just how many species Gola forest supports. And this is what the figures look like so far. So you can see we've got over 600 species of butterflies, 75 mammals, lots of dragonflies and damselflies. Now, those figures may not mean very much to you because there's not really much to compare them with. So if I tell you that Gola is about the half the size of Greater London, so it will fit into Britain many, many times. And I'm going to show you in grey the figures for all the species recorded in, in the UK, in Britain. So you can see we have only 28 mammals in the whole of our country. Gola has 75. We have only 59 butterflies. Gola has 600. So this is a really rich, rich environment and a very special one for wildlife. But like lots of tropical forests, it's very heavily threatened. It's threatened by logging for timber. It's threatened by mining for diamonds. And it's also threatened very much by what we call slash and burn agriculture. The local people who clear the forest through so cutting and burning to grow crops. And what that means is over time, the forest has shrunk and shrunk to the border with Liberia, where there are lots of big forests. And you can see that from this picture. So this is an aerial image looking down. So this is the uh, coast of Africa here. The black is the border with Liberia. And the little black bits here are the three bits that make up Gola Forest. And you can see it sort of shrunk to the big forest of Liberia. And a combination of the work we did showing just how important it was for wildlife and just how threatened it was led to the government uh, declaring it a national park. And they did that in 2011, so that's almost 20 years after we started working there. Um, and it was a, only the second national park in this country. And that means it's recognised and it's protected. And the Sierra Leone government refer to it as their green diamond. So this was really fantastic for us. It was a huge landmark in all of the work we'd done to show how important this forest was. But the problem is that just declaring it as a protected area does not necessarily mean it's protected on the ground. And protecting it costs money. Um, so we had to look now for a way to fund the protection of this forest. How do we get the money to try to support it and keep it safe? And we turned to something which is called carbon finance. Now, this is really a very simple idea. It was quite new at the time, it isn't now. Now, most of you will know, so the younger people in the audience may have to help the adults a bit to understand this, but I'm going to rely on you. So the young people will know when a plant is growing, it's sucking up carbon dioxide into itself and converting it basically into its structure. So it's basically absorbing a gas that's important in terms of climate change and converting it into things like this, into wood. So this is a bit of sustainable wood from my log pile. So it's locking up carbon dioxide. And that means that this is storing carbon that would otherwise um, contribute to climate change. So a forest that's stood and that's growing is helping us to control climate change. If you chop those trees down, the carbon in this wood will eventually end up in the atmosphere and contribute to climate change. And that means that forests like this not only support people and wildlife, but they also help in tackling climate change if you keep them standing. And there's now a big international uh, sort of framework which allows you to buy and sell carbon uh, to try and keep those forests in place. And it's called RED. And it stands for, this is a bit technical bit, reducing emissions from tropical deforestation and degradation. So stopping carbon dioxide, get into the atmosphere by chopping down trees. You're paying to keep the carbon locked up in a live tree. Now, if you want to sell your carbon, this means that Gola Forest, we can sell the carbon um, and use that money to protect the forest. But we need to know how much carbon we've got before we can start to sell it. And that's where it gets a bit complicated. So I'm going to look at the younger, younger ones here to make sure your parents follow this, OK? So this is a very simple diagram. So this is, a, this is carbon dioxide. That's a gas going off into the atmosphere, OK? And this is time. Now, if you protect your forest, all that carbon stays locked up in the wood, OK? And that means there are no, there's no carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. It's all naught, that red line. Does that make sense? Now, if you chop your forest down, the carbon that was locked in here ends up in the air. And that means this blue line here. So that's releasing carbon into the atmosphere. OK? Does that make sense? I need you to nod if you follow it. And that means that this difference between these two lines 
That's how much carbon you can sell. That is what your forest is worth. So this is the amount of carbon dioxide I stop going into the air if I keep the forest in its place. OK? So hopefully you followed that and you can ask me questions later if you didn't. But the key is you've got to estimate as a scientist what this is. And that means lots of measuring in the field. So the first thing is, imagine it's like a shop. How much do you have in your shop to start with? How much carbon do I have in my forest? That means how much carbon is related to the, basically the number and the size of your trees. So you have lots of people going out with lots of ladders, climbing trees and measuring the size to estimate their carbon. Um, in fact, they've measured all, over 800 trees uh, throughout the forest to estimate this. Now, the next thing you should know is what would the carbon be in the land it would become if it were no longer forest? So in this case in Gola, if you chop down forest, it becomes, agri becomes crops. People are growing crops. So you have to go out and you have to take lots of samples of crops and work out the carbon in that. And then you need to know how fast, if I didn't protect the forest, how fast would it go from this forest to a crop? You do that by using fantastic aerial photographs from satellites that orbit the, the Earth all the time and take photographs over time that tells you how fast you're losing forest. So you put all of that together and you can work out how much Gola is worth in terms of the carbon it stops going into the air. And here are the figures, and they're quite big figures. It doesn't really matter um, in the context of this talk what they are, but here you go. So if you keep Gola in place, you stop 500,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide going to the atmosphere every year. Now, the average price for carbon is $2 a tonne. It's worked out in American money in dollars, so it's $2 a tonne, and that means we can make a million dollars from Gola uh, every year if we sell all the carbon in that forest. And that's a lot of money to help protect a forest. And the great thing about this project now is that Gola received uh, like basically a gold star for its carbon because mm. it's, uh, it's a very fantastic project in terms of how it's helping wildlife and people. And you can now buy carbon credits from Gola. Uh, you can go onto the website, onto a website, and you can, you can buy some carbon credits and you can help to uh, contribute to helping climate change and also to helping Gola Forest. So we've now got the forest protected. We've got a way to try and fund some of it. But you might think to yourself, well, a million dollars a year, that's quite a lot of money to protect a forest. What is that all being used for? And it's very important to say it's not just used for people to patrol and protect it. We do have people patrolling to stop illegal activity. But a lot of the money goes into helping the local communities around the forest. So about 120 local communities who live around the forest and if you can help them to improve their own life, they won't need to go into the forest uh, and to hunt for the wildlife or to chop down trees in the same way. So we spent a lot of time in these communities. Uh, we asked what would really make a difference to your life, uh, and they told us lots of things that would help. And the most important things we've worked on, so here are some of the people that we talked. You can see, uh, perhaps you can see there's a, sadly a monkey on this guy's bicycle, which is an illegal bit of, bit of uh, wild meat. And they told us we want some, a way of having... Uh, like a banking system in our communities so that we can start to loan money and buy better equipment for agriculture and also to send our children to school. So we set up some loan schemes. We have about 500 women mainly who've accessed these schemes and many of them use it to send their children to school. Alongside the schools, we set up uh, wildlife clubs to teach the children about how important the wildlife is and the forest that they live in. And we also worked very closely with people to help them grow better crops and more of them. So this is a lady who's harvested rice here, and this is cassava. So we worked to help them improve how they grow crops from their land to need to use less land uh, to support their family. And finally, we also helped them to grow much better cocoa uh, to provide chocolate for people like us. Because, the, because we all love chocolate, and there's a big market for it. So we worked with people to help them, first of all, grow new cocoa, oops, new cocoa trees. This is a lady with a, in a nursery to plant out new trees. Uh, we helped them to manage their cocoa better. So this is a pod, uh, full of, a cocoa pod. Inside there are the seeds uh, that you get your chocolate from. Um, cocoa is really good, in fact, for birds. So that's great. We can grow great cocoa and do really good stuff for wildlife at the same time. And when we started in Gola, three years ago, we started this work, we had 13 tonnes of cocoa. Now we're exporting 70. So we've improved it a lot. Uh, this, is the cocoa, oop, this is the cocoa bean um, uh, and some very proud cocoa farmers. Um, these are some of the birds you find in the cocoa forests. 
uh, and this is the chocolate. So this is chocolate only from Gola. You can say it says, eat chocolate, save a rainforest. That sounds like a really great thing to do. So if you go into an RSPB shop, you can buy this. You can buy this and think, I'm helping pygmy hippos. I'm helping children go to school. Uh, all of that money will go towards it. So that's all part of the scheme, uh, the science has got us to there, to try and save this forest through lots of different ways. So I hope I've shown you very quickly how you can use science uh, to move a forest from unknown and unprotected to protected uh, for its wildlife, like these, and also for its people. Thanks very much. For our second talk, I would like to introduce Dr. Michaela Leonardi with Back to the Future, Species Distribution Through Time. This is Europe 40,000 years ago. This is a reconstruction of how Europe, how vegetation was in Europe 40,000 years ago. And uh, we can see we have a lot of ice here, we have some tundra here, a lot of taiga, which is this kind of conifer forest. And then we have some kind of temperate forest and some warm open areas down here. So let's go a, li a little bit uh, forward in time to 20,000 years ago. The ice age is at its maximum. So as you can see, the ice is covering most of Northern Europe and the tundra is, is covering northeastern Europe. We still see a lot of forest here and still some open space in the east, uh, southeastern corner. Another step in time, 20,000 years ago, this is much more similar to what we have now because we see that most Europe is covered in forest. The ice is retiring because the, the climate is getting warmer and warmer. And uh, if we do our last step and we go into the present, that's what we are now, where we are, are now. Or let's say where we would be if cities and, and agriculture wouldn't be there. So we have a lot of forests, different kind of forests all covering Europe. We have a lot of open area, open uh, habitats uh, in uh, Eastern and Central Europe. And then we have some warm forests, which is actually what you could see just in the UK, just outside Cambridge. So as you have seen, the climate has changed so much during the last 40,000 years, and the same continent we are living in was so much different just 40,000 years ago, just for me, because I'm used to t talk about uh, distant past. So when the climate changed, uh, what animals can do? The first thing they could do is just to move. So they have some habitat preferences. There are some kind of habitat they prefer, they are used to live in, they could follow it. So this habitat moves and the animals move with, hit, with it. The other option is to evolve. You may be familiar with this guy. His specimens are just there in the corner. And basically, when the climate change, the environment change, evolution may happen because selection uh, help uh, the species change. And this is what gave us all the wonderful diversity we have today. So uh, I will tell you a story of what happened during those big climate variations when uh, just telling about horses. So why horses? Horses are a very peculiar animal. Because, uh, fun fact, there are no wild horses in the world right now. They are all domesticated. And, uh, but before being domesticated, they were a very important species in Europe. And we find them in a lot, a lot of archaeological excavation. So this is an excavation I was excavating there because as a, the, an education, I was an archaeologist. So this is an excavation. And basically, each, each label you can see here is a different level of human occupation. And we can get dates for all those levels. And we can get dates for the bones we find in the excavations. And so I've been digging for dates associated to horse remains in Europe, just to understand how their distribution changed through time. Uh, to do this work, I wasn't really digging. I was basically digging into books. 
and uh, scientific articles, thousands of them. But finally, I was so happy because I found more than 3,000 dates for horses across the last 50,000 years in Europe. So uh, just to give you an idea how big this is, when I started my project, I was talking with a person doing this, um, a person doing the same project on many species, and he had the best data set available for horses at that time, and he had 300 dates. I had 3,000, so I'm super excited about it. So this is my data set, and you may say, well, this is not many points, and you're right, because basically here we collapse all the time slices. So behind every point, you may have four or five or 20 of them for different time slices. But again, you have to filter them. Some of them are, may not be accurate. Some of them are not in the right area. So basically, I ended up with 50 uh, 50 580 um, points. And basically, normally, when you want to reconstruct the distribution of a species, you just take points on a map, and you can draw around a line, and you know the species was living there. But then, this is a single time slice, and the others are not much better. The number of points is not enough to draw a line around them, because we may have a sample bias. So we have to study those points in a, a little bit more complicated way which is why computers have been invented. Mm -hmm. So I've been using very complex statistical models to reconstruct the distribution of horses through time. And uh, this is what I found. I'm just showing you the four time slices I've been showing you before, but I have that continuously through time. The green is where horses were able to live. The, um, Khaki is where horses weren't able to live, and the white is where ice was. And we could see that the di distribution of horses through time changed. And this is interesting. But the most interesting bit is that it changed, but they didn't change their habitat preferences. Basically, during this, this long time in which climate changed so, so much, they didn't evolve. They were just following the habitat they were most used to. And this is a very interesting point. Because right now, we are taking back our time machine, and we are going to the present. Right now, we are having a lot of human activities which are changing the climate. And we have been discussing that uh, just a few minutes ago. And this caused some problems, because the same, um, the same job I've been doing for the past can be done for the future. And so we can use the work I've been doing for horses, for other species, to understand what the future could be. Because if we know where they have been in the past and where they are in the present, we could see where they could be in the future. And we, so for my method, we could use any vertebrate species where we could find remains in archaeological sites. Obviously, that would be much more difficult to do it with insects, for example, or for birds, because bird bones are not conserved as much as, uh, as mammal bones in, uh, in sites. Now, we have a problem. The problem is time, because I showed you four time slices that were uh, separated by several, um, several thousands of years. But we don't have this kind of time now. Because the climate is changing so rapidly that basically the evolution, this is the, uh, the, the tree of life that you can see behind there. So the evolution that brought us this wonderful tree of life takes a lot of time to happen. And it takes a lot of time for species to get, uh, uh, to change, to adapt to climate, to different climates. So the only option for species right now is to move. So this is a, um, a picture taken from space of Europe during night. Every bit of light is a city, a village. And then obviously you have ro roads, rails. So just imagine you're a horse, a bear, whatever, living in the middle of, uh, of Spain. And there's not 
you don't have any more your, your habitat, but the, the habitat is, for example, in France now. So 10,000 years ago, they could just walk and go there, but now they can't. An animal could not cross all those human activities. So one problem is that moving in some areas of the world is becoming more and more difficult for animals. Another problem is that even if you could move, there are other problems with moving. For example, gorillas, their um, habitat is shrinking. And they possibly could move, but there are their habitat is just there. They can't go to another place because it's not their habitat anymore. Or just imagine la uh, lemurs. So they live in an island. If their habitat is not anymore there in, uh, in Madagascar, they can't just swim and go into the mainland. Or there are animals that are too small to move, for example, or they're not adapted to move. Or there are animals that would be able to move, but we are disrupting their life in a different way. So honestly, <laughs> the future doesn't look very bright for animal species right now. So the take home message I would like you to remember is that species are able to cope with time, with climate change through time, but they may not be able to cope with the present one because we are making it too fast. So basically, unfasten your seatbelt, get back to the present, and build a better future. Our third talk is from Fleur Nash on exploring gender and conservation from perspectives of animals, humans, and being a researcher. Yeah, great. Okay, well, thank you so much everyone for coming and it's really exciting to be here celebrating International Women's Day. It's also really exciting to be sharing this space with so many amazing female researchers. And so what I wanted to talk to you all about today is gender in conservation. So just a bit of background on me, I've just started a PhD here at Cambridge and I'm working conservation. But I'm working more on the kind of human side of conservation, so how humans work in protecting animals and environments. And I was thinking about for this talk about International Women's Day and what that means and gender equality. So I wanted to kind of just use a few examples to try and get us all thinking about how gender and conservation are very much interlinked and in how our views of gender affect how we interact with animals, environments and other humans in conservation. So I'm going to take you through three different perspectives. So one, the perspective of animals, the perspective of humans in conservation projects, and then the perspective from myself of being a female researcher and kind of what that means. So firstly, I'll use the first example as a, a perspective from animals. And this is a really interesting, so there's a female researcher called Juno Salazar Perenas, and she looked at this orangutan captive breeding program in Malaysia. And well, it's in this state called Sarak, which is a semi-autonomous state in Malaysia. So an orangutan captive breeding program is where orangutans are really endangered in many of the tropical rainforests in Malaysia. And to try and increase numbers, some orangutans are brought in from the wild, then made to kind of mate with each other to increase that population with the idea that then they'll be released back into the wild and orangutan numbers will increase. That's kind of in short what it is. But what um, Juno Salazar Perenas was kind of looking at is how our views of gender or how to look at this in a kind of in a gendered way. And when I talk about gender, I mean not the kind of biological sense that kind of um, your, your chromosomes means you're a male or female, but this social idea of gender. So when we call someone a female or a male, what does that mean? And what kind of expectations and assumptions do we have of those people or those animals? So using kind of more feminist ideas, um, Juno was looking at how the male and the female orangutan are kind of made to mate to increase the numbers of orangutan species. So the female orangutan is forced into this cage with the male orangutan and they're forced to mate. And she talks about it being quite a violent process um, where the female, and she questions these ideas around consent. Does the female want to be mating with this male? And even uses really strong words like, is it rape? Which we talk about a lot in a human society, but don't think about when we think about animals. 
And I thought this was a really interesting example of how we can think about gender in a different way in conservation and thinking about if we're thinking about the individual right of that female orangutan, does that change how we think about conservation in general? So that's kind of just one example. Definitely we can talk about this artists and ask questions at the end, but I just wanted to use just a few different examples to get us thinking in different ways. So the second example I want to talk about, so we're going over to Nepal now, where the, another female researcher called Andrea Nightingale was looking at community forest programs in Nepal. So a community forestry program is where the kind of local community is given access and rights over a particular bit of forest. And this is kind of also funded by charities coming in or the government. And they kind of control how much that forest is used for their local needs and also making sure it meets its conservation targets around deforestation. And in, gen in conservation and development projects, a lot of the moment, gender is a really big buzzword where they're trying to increase gender equality in societies through conservation, which sounds great on paper. But one way that they're kind of doing this, or it seems to be a tick box exercise, is saying there's a committee in the community that manages the decisions around these forests. And the conservation kind of charities say you have to have equal number of men and women on this committee and some women in decision-making positions. Again, sounds great on paper, so they kind of tick this box and say, right, you've got gender equality here, that's perfect. But what this researcher, Andrea Nightingale, was doing when she was spending more time with these communities and thinking about gender in a more subtle way in that society was showing that even though there were equal number of men and women on this committee or a woman was the head of the committee, the men were still very much the ones making the decisions. They had the power in the society and nothing had actually changed in terms of gender equality. So we thought, thought this again was an interesting example about how complex gender is and when we're working in conservation, especially with other communities and other societies, we might need to understand gender in a different way and how men and women are perceived in that area. And the third example I wanted to take you through was kind of my personal perspective of being a female scientist, more of a social scientist, in doing research and how I find that my gender being women impacts on the research that I can do. So my research is working with a conservation organisation called Fauna and Flora International. And I'm looking at how they, as an international charity, work with local partners on the ground in projects that they're implementing. So I'm working in Kenya, so this is a place of a place in Kenya called Laikipia, and I'll be going out there for about a year to understand how an international organization like FFI work with local communities, local people on the ground, how they interact with the environment around them. And so being a female researcher out in Kenya for a year is quite interesting. And I've been thinking about it a lot from the terms of being a female and how people receive me and how I'll interact with others in these ideas of gender. And I've never really had to think about much about my gender much in terms of my everyday living in Britain. But if I'm thinking about it in Kenya, it is very different how men and women are, see are seen. So for example, a lot of conservation is quite a male dominated space, especially out in the place I'm going to in Kenya. There's a lot of kind of um, it's very macho, manly, owning these ranches, land, farmers. And so I might not be able to access certain spaces by being a female. So if all the decisions are made by males, they might not want a female there. So then I might not be able to get that information for my research. But then on the other hand, with the women, I might be able to understand more what it's like to be a woman out in Kenya and working on these conservation projects because they might feel more comfortable talking to me. Whereas if I was a male researcher, they might not want to talk to me. So it's these kind of different barriers that your own gender can impact on what research that you're doing. And another example I've been thinking about when people say that you can use your gender to your advantage when you're doing research or whatever area you're working in. So some people would say that women can be stereotyped as kind of being a bit naive and not that threatening, especially to men who might find other men threatening. So then 
And this is what one of my supervisors said to me, that you could kind of use that to kind of be like, oh, I'm just here to ask some questions. I'm just really interested in you. And actually trying to get some information on the side for my research. Whereas if I was a man, they might not want to engage with me at all because they might find me kind of threatening and trying to take over their power. Which I thought was a really interesting tactic to use as a, as a kind of method for doing research. But I don't know if I really agreed with that, because I, I see very much men and women as equal, having equal power, equal strength. And I don't know if I want to reinforce those stereotypes of playing this kind of naive woman card to get me into certain spaces. So these are three kind of just quite different but similarish examples of what I've been thinking about or what it means to kind of gender and conservation. And I thought that it would be a way to kind of maybe get us all to think slightly differently about how we think about gender in our everyday lives, be it in our school classes, be it in our home or in our workplace. And I heard something on the news today, um, today this week, to do with International Women's Day, saying that the UK Parliament is 39th in the world for female representation, and that we're trying to increase female representation in Parliament, which again sounds great, but to me, as a kind of critical social scientist and trying to unpick that, I was thinking, well, what does that mean? Yes, we might have an equal or trying to get more equal number of men and women in Parliament, but is that actually changing who's making those decisions? And are those decisions still made predominantly by men in society? So the last point I wanted to finish off was kind of this idea of how we view the environment through a kind of a gendered point of view. So this was an amazing picture I've just found on the internet of this idea of Mother Earth. And we kind of interact with the environment or see it as this kind of Mother Earth. So it's kind of, we see it as quite female. And there's sometimes this idea that women are more inherently connected to the environment through kind of women having more nurturing and reproductive qualities and more responsibility. But I think that's really important to question because it seems in, in the community forestry projects in Nepal, this idea that women are the ones that know more about the environment because they collect the firewood because they need the firewood to cook in their homes because the role of the women is to be in the home and that is a very domesticated role, not necessarily this kind of female connection with the environment that some people might argue about. So to conclude, I hope these three different examples from the kind of perspective of animals, perspectives of humans and conservation products, perspective of being a female researcher and our general idea of kind of Mother Earth and what that means, maybe has got you thinking slightly differently about gender and how we interact with others around us, how we interact with animals and the environment, and also how we feel that other people perceive us based on our gender. Thank you. So our fourth speaker is Dr. Elia Benito Gutierrez with Deep Ocean Origins of the Backbone. I can speak over. So 550 million years ago, something absolutely extraordinary happened. And it happened right there in the seafloor. At that time of this geological period, what we call the Cambrian Explosion, um, is basically um, what happened is um, a huge amount of diversity of animal forms came up in the, in the sea floor, in the ocean, as you can see here. So essentially, this is kind of like the big bang in biological terms, right? So all ancestors of all animals that we know nowadays were originated back then. And here you can see a representation of uh, the soft corals, the first predators that look like squids, for example, here. And it was an environment that it was very rich in sediments and very rich in um, uh, conditions that we still don't well understand that basically push all this diversity to acquire undulatory movement and a lot of sophisticated behaviors and, um, and morphologies. And this one that you see here swimming was the first chordate. This is the animal that gave rise to all animals with a backbone, including us. This um, was a very, very primitive chordate, as you can see here, undulatory movement. No predatory um, structures or anything, very gentle, you know, siri here, tentacles, very simple in body plan, 
but that basically would give rise to a huge diversity of vertebrate forms, animals with a backbone, and including this animal here, which is basically considered the first ever fish that has been found in the fossil record. Of course, all these animals are now extinct. And the way it looks like this now, so all these animals have extinct, but descendants have basically um, survived uh, until now. And this is the way it looks in the fossil sites uh, where they have found all these um, different animals in different sediments. So here is where they found the first chordate. So these are very rare sediments because these are um, 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 rich in soft body animals, which are particularly difficult to sediment. You have probably heard a lot, of, a lot about dinosaurs. You know, they have backbones, they have, they have um, bones and hard structures that fossilize well, but the soft body ones are very, very difficult. There are several places in the world, not many, but some of these uh, points that you see here, they are very similar to what is called the Burgess Shale that probably many of you have heard about, um, where the, these fossils have been found. And during this geological time that approximately lasts for um, 25 million years, there was something also very particular about this, which is that um, in the previous geological era, era the Decadian, the substrate was very firm, but during the Cambrian, the substrate was very soft, so animals could burrow. And these um, uh, scientists, scientists think in general that could have pushed these animal forms to acquire these sophisticated uh, mechanisms to burrow, swim, you know, go in and go out, because this period of time also coincides with the apparition of the first predators. So animals with soft bodies and no appendixes, like for example, Picaya, the, the animal that I have shown you your, um, just now that is considered the first chordate, uh, this animal didn't have anything to defend themselves. So what they could do is to burrow, and that's why this first chordate um, is considered um, that probably was a burrower. So, this is a schematic representation of this first uh, chordate. And as you can see, it's very, very simple body plan, similar to ours. It has a head and a tail. It does not have any um, sign of uh, body segmentation, like you see, for example, in, this, in um, annelids, you know, like this is colopendras and things like this. But um, it's very similar to an animal that nowadays exists, which is called Amphioxus. This is a very small group of animals, collectively named like this, Amphioxus, and, and they are very similar and have a lot of characteristics that resemble to that of Picaya. So they have a postanal tail, uh, shapes, um, B-shaped myotomes. So we also have B-shaped myotomes, but we don't see it so well. It's more obvious in a fish. When you basically eat a slice of fish, you can see all the muscles around. And Amphioxus looks like this. And uh, internally, they also have this notochord, the notochord is a very interesting uh, structure because during embry embryogenesis, even in, uh, in humans and all animals with a backbone, what they do is to basically uh, induce the formation of our spinal nerves and all the brain and all these, um, um, so the, the nervous system, the nerve core that we have in the back. This was an important change of the body plan during evolution. And this is exactly what we see in Amphioxus. The difference is that we only have it when we are very embryos, very little embryos, few days wh while we are uh, in our mothers. But in Amphioxus, this uh, notochord is for life. It's like a permanent embryo throughout their entire life. And this primitive uh, structure is very uh, much uh, similar to other fossils that have been found that are similar to uh, the first fishes like animals that uh, came up in, um, in the earth. And so these animals are unique. So this is the way um, they look. Most of the scientific uh, research has been done with branchiostomas, you can see here. And um, I discovered this model system very early in my, in my university studies. And I just basically decided to um, bring the possibility of doing research with uh, this animal 
because it has a lot of interesting features and uh, is not been so thoroughly studied because of technical challenges and everything. And I will uh, show you um, why. So basically, uh, these two, um, we discovered them quite recently. They are still undescribed. There is a couple of papers about this animal um, like many years ago. And this one is a completely new one that we are trying to now characterize. But you have to take into consideration that the difference, so we have uh, sequenced the genomes and of these three genoses, and uh, they are separated about 200 million years between them. They look very similar, isn't it? So you have to consider that the difference between um, the divergence time between a human and a mouse is 80 million years, how different we look like. So that's the reason why they are considered like living fossils, because they seem not to have changed in hundreds of years. So they are basically belonging to the phylum uh, chordate, so they are the only cephalochordates that uh, are alive, these three different genuses. They are broadly distributed, as you can see, through, um, uh, through different parts of the world. And um, they have separated sexes. You can see a little bit the color of the gonads is what basically distinguishes males and females, but there is m nothing more. And they, have, um, they reproduce sexually by external fertilization. So this is a close-up of these animals, so beautiful animals. They are um, very simple, but at the same time, they have differences of um, very, very particular differences between asymmetry, symmetry of the body and but they are very, very, they have a very concerned morphology between them, as you can see. They are also cyclops, as you can see here. There is a little eye here in the very front of the brain. So that's the little brain, and that's all the neural tube. And underneath this, this structure here is the notochord. It's basically the structure that gave rise to our backbone. This is just a close-up to show you the, the, the nice uh, ten tentacles that they have. This is the mouth which is very similar to what you see in the fossils of Picaya. And as Picaya, they are also burrowers. So they live in the seafloor and they have this undulatory movement, very similar to Picaya. And what you can see here is like the schematic representation I showed you before, where you have the notochord here. And above it, there is the neural tube that has a very small brain here. They have gills, so basically they breathe like uh, fishes, but they are filter feeders. They don't have any you know, mouth structures or anything. This is basically the, the where they lay the eggs. The anus would be here. And this is basically what it gave rise in evolution to our backbone. So in us, during embryogenesis, what this happens is that it's calcified, and then it will form our intervertebral discs. So in essence, in the lab, what we are trying to understand is actually um, how from an animal like an amphioxus, you get through development the complexity that we see in vertebrates like us. So the, the interesting thing of amphioxus is that it lies at the root of all chordates, and we think it's generally basically assumed that is probably the, uh, the animal that most resembles the ancestor of all animals with a backbone. This has been like this for hundreds of years. This is an example of Huckel, where um, um, basically they, they were comparing the anatomy of Amphioxus to other animals. So these are tunicates here and lampreys. So this is an embryo of a jawless fish here. And they were trying to basically reconstruct all the events that happened. That the, the interesting thing is also that they have a very uh, similar development to us because they, have, um, they generate all the initial structures. The difference is that they don't end up doing... So they have the cells that will give rise to an arm, but they don't make an arm. And this is in part also what we want to understand. And one of the things that is fascinating about this model system, in 2008 we, uh, we sequenced the first genome, and then what we realized is that actually they have 17 different um, uh, chromosomes, and if you look at the genes that are in each chromosome, you can track these genes in position 
to the, to the genome of uh, the humans. So you can see here, the chromosome number nine would have gene, the gene in yellow, for example, is being du uh, duplicated two times. So there is four of them, four copies in our genome, and you can actually track them in the different chromosomes where you can also see that some of the genomes are occupying, some, some of the genes are occupying the similar position. So it's really cool because you can make kind of a collage with and, and then basically reconstruct the entire human genome using uh, chromosomal fragments from Amphioxus. So this is, this is basically what we think is reflecting the primitive nature of this animal. The problem is that they have a very long biological cycle and most of the research is being done through the 48 first hours of development. They live very long and they have a planktonic phase here in the middle that takes six months to complete. They are not becoming adults until they are one year old. And then it takes three years for them to become sexually reproductive, you know, sexually active. And um, so this was a very big challenge that I took many years ago. And for addressing this challenge, this is a challenge for using it as a model system in the lab, of course. And to address this challenge, I traveled to different parts of the world, this, this map, Basically, I visit many, many parts of it and try to record all the natural conditions where the animals are and then try to bring them into the lab. And this is what I did. What I did is to generate a kind of a semi-automatic facility, which is a sen in a sense um, uh, an ecosystem, a marine ecosystem. It's natural, it has no antibiotic, is basically continuously running seawater. And as you can see, this is one of the uh, amphioxus. We also grow plankton in the lab. We grow um, phytoplankton and zooplankton because this is what, what they eat. They are filter feeders. And we maintain them in their natural substrate. As I told you before, they are burrowers and they like to basically live inside the sun. These are our cultures. And what this facility does is to mimic seasons. So you have moonlight phases, you have um, spring, summer, all the seasons. You, we ch it changes automatically the light conditions to basically mimic the natural conditions. And this is how we um, uh, make that the animals detach from their natural cycle and then adapt to the one we produce in the facility. And why? Because we also work with the embryos and these animals naturally only lay eggs one night in the entire year. When I was doing my PhD, and this is was, was, was what triggered me to basically uh, make all this investment that took uh, um, 15 years of my life. <laughs> it, it's, it's very fast in the movie, but it takes 15 years of my life. And because we were doing the experiments and if you would basically lose that night, and this is how we collect them, then you wouldn't have any embryos for doing any research for an entire year. You would have to wait for the next year. And I was just thinking, these animals are too interesting to have these limitations. So we have to basically fix that. And, and, and this, is, this is how we collect in the Maldives. And this is when I'm explaining how we found these animals that are uh, non-described, which is very exciting. And, um, and that's basically what did uh, push me to collect all this data and reproduce it in this machine. Now we have automatic feeders in our, in our facility here in zoology, which is literally there, is much bigger than this one. It has four units and we have all the animals, we have sea urchins as well, and we have all the community that they need to live like if they were in nature. So these basically allow us to um, develop protocols where when we can do in vitro fertilizations and as you can see here, a younger me many years ago, um, is I'm individualizing the, the, the animals in different calves. So what you do is to induce a light thermal shock, which is in essence, bringing the summer all of the sudden. And then the animals lay the eggs, you collect the eggs and you collect the sperm, you do in vitro fertilizations, and then you can control um, when the embryos are born, what is the stage, and then you can try to understand. The, all the questions that we have in the lab, which are many. And here uh, y you have some individual uh, um, animals. We raise them there. And then if you are lucky, you have these beautiful eggs that are cleavaging. They are like pearls swimming in the water. 
during this um, phase of development, they are <coughs> planktonic. So using these methods, we have managed, we are managing now to uh, get into this side of the cycle um, and to understand how they develop longer. And uh, in essence, in the lab, what we are trying to understand is the molecular basis to um, um, generate complex structures as our brain, our limbs, our legs, and, and all this um, uh, in an organism that morphologically doesn't manifest them, but mor molecularly they are there already. already. And this is also allowing us to do uh, some um, behavioral studies. So these are very early uh, um, embryos. And these are like this size here. So like three days old. And they swim differently. They respond s differently also to the light stimuli. And we are basically trying to understand many things. And here there is um, a video of the adults that for the first time we have actually been able to see how they actually burrow in reality. Because of course this usually happens in the, in the deep sea, so you don't see them, how they, they behave. So we are beginning to understand how they behave, how they develop. We are um, uh, doing a lot of uh, integrative science, working with mathematicians, physics, physicists, uh, using cutting edge technology, now thanks to have the animals in the lab. And I just want to finish by thanking everybody. It's been many years of fighting, and, um, and I, cannot, I have no space to uh, thank everybody that has helped me into this, you know, to this way of constructing all this and, and making the amphioxus available for, for research I in the lab. But um, these are some collaborators, and this is my current lab here in zoology. And this is uh, an example of some of the things that we are doing. We are doing a lot of 3D imaging where we see single cells and we know they are what they are expressing. And we try to basically see how the, 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 the expression of certain genes change during development to understand what is the minimal um, kind of molecular combination that you need to generate certain organs that are very important for our lives. And with this, I would like to thank you for listening. Now introducing Dr. Amelia Hood with why did the cobra cross the road to get to the termite mount? In the kind of cobra talk, but it's actually more of a termite talk and I've just disguised it under exciting snakes. Um, okay, so I'm Millie. Um, I just finished my PhD in October and now I'm working as a scientist here in a different research group. And uh, for my PhD, I was studying insects mostly. And this talk is about a little project which I did over a two-week period. Okay, so this is our protagonist, the king cobra. And they're endemic to the forests in Southeast Asia. So this is Southeast Asia. It includes like Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, that kind of area. And this is highlighted. This island here is Sumatra. It's a really large island and um, it's part of Indonesia. And that is where this study was conducted. So the king cobras are uh, listed as vulnerable by the IUCN red list, which means that they're a species which we need to think about the impact that we're having on to do with human disturbance. We need to make sure we take care of them. They're a pretty intimidating snake. Their bites are deadly, so yeah, you don't want to get bitten by them, basically. And they will bite you. Um, they grow to be really enormous, like two meters. I don't know what the largest one ever was, but I'd see them as quite large. And um, they mostly eat small mammals or sometimes other snakes or reptiles. Okay, and this is where our cobra is set. Does anybody recognize this kind of habitat? Yeah? It does look like the rainforest, and it is in the area where the rainforest is, so that is a good guess, but it's actually not a rainforest. So all these trees are planted quite regularly. This is actually an agricultural landscape, and these are palm trees, and they're growing palm oil. Um, so this is an oil palm plantation. So just a quick introduction to oil palm. This is what a plantation looks like. 
Within the plantation, you grow these orange fruits. They grow in these huge bunches, which are about four or five kilograms a bunch. Um, and they're chopped off every couple of weeks, makes this oil, palm oil. And palm oil is in loads of different things. So 80% of palm oil that's produced goes into food products and 20% goes into like um, lipsticks, biofuel, um, cleaning products, things like that. Um, the majority of palm oil is produced in Malaysia and Indonesia. So these circles represent this, the volume of production. And um, it's the most produced and traded vegetable oil in the world. So about 40% of vegetable oil that's on the market is palm oil. So it's really highly abundant. And it's found in about half of all packaged products sold in the supermarket. And you might be thinking, when I read all the labels on my packaging, I don't see palm oil. Or maybe, like me, you don't read the labels. But this is um, what palm oil can also be called. So you won't necessarily be able to recognize it for what it is because it's got lots of different names. So you might be thinking about it in this context. This is generally the context which people tend to think about it as we had nice primary rainforest, which you just um, mentioned. And then that's cut down to re be replaced with palm oil. This is like at the early stage before it's grown and this is the mature stage. So um, yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge that really, that that is what's happening. Um, and this deforestation, so the changing of the forest and the replanting with palm oil is bad for biodiversity. So this is what you will have heard um, and that's Correct. So this is a, a graph of species richness and abundance of species. So basically what this is showing is that the abundance of most species and species richness goes down when you convert to palm oil. However, this isn't to say that palm oil is actually a bad crop because it is the most productive oil crop. It's four to five times more productive than any other vegetable oil. So um, the calls to boycott it are not, would not be a good idea for biodiversity. And if you want to learn more about that, I'll point you in a direction on that at the end, but I'm not going to talk about that now. But happy to chat about it if you want to talk about it. Okay, so back to our snake. So um, palm oil, as I said, is having a bad impact environmentally. And what the research group that I was in does is looks at how we can grow, grow palm oil in a more sustainable way. It's never going to be as biodiverse as rainforest, but what's the best way that we can grow it if we're going to grow it? And encouraging things like this lovely, beautiful cobra here is a good thing to do because they eat the rats, and the rats are really abundant in the plantation, and the rats eat the oil palm fruit. So if you have more snakes, you have less rats, and then you have less fruit eaten, and it's a healthier system. So we like the snake, we want to keep the snake. Um, oh, it seems to have a question for us. Does anybody speak snake in here that can translate this? Do we have any snake speakers? No? Is that Harry Potter, the world's most famous parcel tongue? Okay, wh how, what is she saying, Harry? Right, so our snake is pregnant and needs to lay her eggs somewhere, and we're going to need to decide where we're going to lay our eggs. So, what do you think is important when you are a king cobra? Put yourself in the mindset. You're slithering through the undergrowth. It's hot. It's the tropics. There's a lot of things around. Are they friendly? Are they not friendly? What are we looking for when we're looking for somewhere to lay our eggs? Yeah? Somewhere comfy, definitely. That is exactly right. So somewhere comfy means that it needs to be the right temperature and it can't be too wet and it can't be too dry. So these eggs are kind of, they're not really hard shelled, so they need to be protected from too much heat, too much water, just like when we go to bed at night, you don't want to be too hot, too cold in the bath. You know, you want to be in the right kind of situation. Um, what else do they need? So they need to be in the right temperature and humidity. Any ideas? Did anybody have eggs for breakfast? Yummy, yummy eggs, tasty eggs, yummy, delicious eggs. You've got to make sure there's nobody around who's going to want to eat your eggs for breakfast. So they've got to be kept away from predators, lay them somewhere safe. So let's take a look at what we have in the plantation. So this is a young, these are pictures that I took while I was out there. And this is a young plantation. How does that look? Yeah, it looks good. but. This is going to be about 39 degrees. It's going to be really, really hot, way too hot, not nice. Don't, don't go there. This one, 
it could be nice, but there's a lot of people there and these people are going to be tramping around. They maybe don't like big deadly snakes <laughs> or maybe, yeah, probably not a good idea to lay our eggs there. It looks a little bit too busy. This looks quite nice. It's shaded. There's a bit of vegetation, but there's not that much vegetation. And there's, so you're not going to have that much protection from predators, I think. What about this? What's this? Does anybody know what this is? Yeah? I don't know what specifically that is, but like they do love piles where snakes can grow. Yeah, they do do that. That is a good management intervention, which people do. Um, but that's not what this is. This is actually a big mound of earth. It's about two and a half meters tall. And you can see another one in the background. And it was made by insects. So this is a termite mound. This is a species of termis called, termite called Macrotermes gilvus, and it's basically the only, well, it's 99% it's of the termites that you would find in the oil palm plantation is this one species of termite. And they're really important because, um, actually, I think that's on the next slide. Okay. <laughs> Yay, our snake is happy. It's going to lay its eggs in this termite mound. <laughs> okay, so um, they build these big mounds because... It's where they all live. But they, these termites in particular have this special kind of symbiosis. And a symbiosis is like when two things interact with each other and they um, have a relationship with each other. And this termite has a relationship with this fungus. So this is a fungus comb. And these are, they look kind of like lungs and they're sort of soft and crumbly. And they are grown in chambers throughout the termite mound in very specific places. And they're protected by this hard soil. So this soil is much harder than the soil in the ground because the termites really make sure that they pack it in, keep everything safe. And this relationship is over 25 million years old. So it's very, very old. Um, OK, so there's lots of different kinds of termites that live in the termite mound. They're all the same species. They all came from the same mother but they look different. And some of the ones that we have go out, they're foragers, and they go out into the plantation and they eat dead leaves and wood, and then they poop it out into something called pseudo feces, um, which they bring back to the nest. And then the termites which stay in the chambers with the fungus combs collect that, and they put it onto these structures and they use it to cultivate this fungus, which they then eat. So they're farmers. They're some of the original farmers. And um, to do this, it's similar to where we want, to, we, it's a similar thing to thinking of where we, we're gonna lay our eggs. It needs to be the right temperature, it needs to be the right humidity. So they build the nest in such a way that air is sucked in through the bottom and then pulled up through the top and it regulates the temperature and the humidity of the whole nest and all of the chambers. But they also do something else because I have definitely, I'm not very good at growing things. I don't know, maybe we have some green fingers around here. But sometimes I would try to grow things with soil that I've left in the garden. This is what happened to me recently. And it just got covered in fungus, but not yummy, delicious fungus like what these guys wanted to grow. The nasty fungus, which you don't want on your plants. So they are really clever and they go and collect antibacterial and antimicrobial compounds and they disinfect the nest. So it's a nice temperature, it's a nice humidity, and it's clean. OK, so it regulates temperature and humidity. They disinfect the nest, and it's protected from predators because it's hard to get into. And they have also have these angry termite soldiers, which, if they bite you, they may even break the skin, in my experience. Um, OK, this is just, so this is, n these three are not my pictures, but this is to show you what happens when you fill a termite mound with cement. And you can see these chambers, which I was describing. And you can see they're really big. They're two meters tall. These are massive termite mounds in Africa um, on the plains. And they're so large that you can actually see them from space. They're these huge structures. So they're really important for the turnover of the soil. And some of these mounds here have been dated to more than 2,000 years old. So they've lasted. I mean, it's just absolutely insane to think that they could have lasted for that long. It's kind of hard to believe, but the scientists found it, so we have to believe it. <laughs> um, and this is a picture which I took of a royal chamber, which is in the center of the mound, and that's where the queen is. The queen is this yellow thing, and it's kind of like a, she's kind of like a, like, 
fat, gloopy sausage that just sort of um, pumps babies out her whole life. And these are little babies. Um, okay, so this is what the project looked like. So for two weeks, we opened up 64 termite mounds to investigate what was in them. Completely emptied them out. Everything was going to be destroyed anyway, so this is not a um, destructive. It was it was going to be removed anyway, basically. So we had a team of about six people and dug up tons and tons of soil and found really interesting things. So this relationship that I was describing between the snakes and the termites hadn't been found for these groups before. So it's a really exciting new discovery. They found birds nesting in termite mounds in the trees in um, South America, in Brazil, and they found that those birds had fewer parasites and they um, were more successful in things. But yeah, it's not, we don't really know. We haven't really fully investigated this relationship yet because we only just found it last year. And these are examples of other things that we found. So these are the king cobra eggs. This is a massive python. These are two other species of smaller snakes, which may actually eat the termites as well because that's their primary diet. This is a blind snake. It looks like a worm, but it is a snake. It hadn't <coughs> been found in the region before. So that's really exciting. And these are two um, tarantulas. This is a tenny day snake, a sporas or spider, oh dear, <coughs> Sparacidae spider, and then we also found scorpions nesting in the mound, so a whole range of things. Um, so really important for biodiversity. So the moral of the story is that we should protect these mounds. So a lot of plantation owners actually remove the mounds because they think that they're, the termites in them are pest species, because there are pest species of termites that will completely decimate <coughs> the crops, but they don't live in these mounds, they live in the trees, um, eating them. So these mounds are good for biodiversity. They're good for pest control because they have these big snakes and they also have other pest control agents like ants and spiders which eat the invertebrate pests. And they're also good for soil health because they have the lovely termites in them. Um, and I just want to say thanks to everyone who has helped me on the project, especially YU who was in the field with me um, all the time. And if you do want to learn more about oil palm and what we should do about it, I recommend this um, report which was written by the IUCN and it's also in an infographic so you can also it also just has like four pages of images if you don't want to read the report so it's really it's really well researched and well presented I think okay thanks very much so now we have Dr Kate Sainsbury with a recent history of mammalian carnivores in Britain thank you so I'm a postdoctoral researcher here in the zoology department at the University of Cambridge, but today I'm going to talk to you about some of my PhD research. My PhD was on the recovery of the polecat, Mustela putorius, uh, in Britain. This is, oh, and this is a polecat here. And the polecat is one of Britain's rarer carnivores. And my research was trying to understand the factors that affected its recovery. But when I started my research, one of the first things I wanted to understand was how the polecat's fortunes compared to the other native mammalian carnivores that live in this country. So for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to endeavour to tell you 200 years of carnivore history for eight different species. So bear with me, I'll try not to go too fast. So as I've alluded to, there's actually eight species of mammalian carnivores that live in the wild in Britain today. Now some of them will be very familiar to you. There's the fox, badger, otter, pine martin, polecat, wildcat, stoat and weasel. And they've been in this country for 200,000 to 5,000 years when, um, when they came across through kind of various bridges um, after the last glacial freeze. And in the time that they've shared the country with us, they've had mixed fortunes. In the early days, some of the species were popular sources of meat, they were important for fur, and they were also provided sporting interests. But the one thing that they all had in common is that they were mostly viewed as pests, or in old speak, vermin. And the reason for this is that carnivores often compete with humans for food and other resources. And this attitude towards pests or vermin species was cemented in law with the Tudor Vermin Acts, which were enacted in 1566. And as part of these acts, anyone, so you or I, who caught um, vermin species, which was pretty much any wild animal or bird, would take it to the local church warden who would exchange the carcass for money. And this is an excerpt from a church parish account in Kent, where you can see that different people were being paid for foxes, hedgehogs, 
and polecats. But in spite of several hundred years of what was effectively state-sponsored culling, it was some 200 years later that we started to notice some catastrophic declines in our carnivore species. These maps, uh, which in green show the distribution extent of a species that was very common in 1800, show that in the space of 100 years, this species declined to the extent that it was really only present in the centre of Wales. And this is what happened to the polecat. How did this come about? Well, there were two catalysts for change. One was the conversion of forest to agricultural lands, and the other was the rise of the sporting estate, particularly the production of game birds. And the reason that the sporting estate was so important was because the role of the gamekeeper was to produce as much game as possible to be shot and eaten. And anything that got in the way of um, maximising game numbers needed to be controlled, and that included both poachers as well as predators. And so killing predators was central to game management in the 19th century. It wasn't only the polecat that was affected by sporting estates, the pine martin and the wildcat also experienced declines. And all three of these species ended up in areas of the country where game management was least. But not all of our predators experienced these declines. Foxes were popular uh, sporting quarry, and this actually to an extent protected them because it was important to leave them for the hunt to deal with in the autumn and winter season. Otters are largely aquatic, so although they were hunted with dogs, they weren't trapped in the same way as other um, predators. And badgers, um, which declined as, as, she, as well as otters did, just not to the same extent, um, they were popular quarry for badger baiting and, and digging of sets and blocking of sets. Um, but they didn't experience any widespread extinctions. And then finally, stoats and weasels are very quick to breed. So while they no doubt, doubt would have been an absolute pain in the proverbial for gamekeepers, actually they breed so quickly that no amount of controls really seems to impact their populations. But this all changed. Come the turn of the 20th century, the First World War broke out. And what happened then was the loss of essentially the entire generation of gamekeepers in the country as they all went off to war and the cessation of all sporting recreation activities in the countryside. And this was good news for all of our carnivores because actually most of them, anecdotally certainly, started to recover. So now we pick up our story with the polecat again. If you remember, in 1915, it was only really extant in this small area of Wales. Well, by the 1970s, polecat distribution had expanded and they were now present in the whole of Wales and moving into the English border counties. Fast forward another 40 years and what the last National Polecat Survey of Britain found was actually that polecats are now present across almost the whole of central, southern, eastern and southwestern England and moving north into, towards Scotland. There are some populations in Scotland, but they're very small and likely to, due, to be due to kind of illicit releases rather than natural organic population spread. What happened? Several things which were really related to populations of rabbits. So the gin trap, which was a leg hole trap that was used to catch rabbits, um, would also catch anything that hunted rabbits. And rabbits are a really important source of prey for polecats in this country. So the traps would be set in rabbit burrows and they would catch polecats and stoats. But this trap was banned in 1958, which made a big difference to the potential for polecats to expand the populations. The other thing that happened was that rabbits were almost eradicated entirely by myxomatosis in 1957-58 and actually there was a whole industry around trapping of rabbits for protein after the war that completely um, stopped. Um, from the 1970s onwards, rabbit populations recovered and we think this is a really important um, cause of the recovery of polecat, um, polecats in this country. And then finally, in 1981, after nearly 100 years sort of following the, the population of deer, the polecat was protected in law for the first time under the Wildlife and Countryside Act. So it's now illegal to take or trap a polecat without a licence, which is the second highest level of protection afforded under the Act. It's very rare to get to see a polecat in the wild even when you study them for four years. And you can see here that this, um, this is a really nice example. It's larger than a ferret. It has a distinctive white facial mask and a creamy undercoat and long dark guard hairs. 
Today, the most common form of mortality for polecats is actually being crushed um, on roads, and that's where you're most likely to see them. This is actually a family of kittens, and they're just hanging around, as you do. <laughs> And in Spain, actually, the kind of proclivity <coughs> for polecats to hang around on roadside verges has been linked to the presence of rabbit, which, which, which tend to burrow there, and so polecats tend to follow on. This brings us on to wild cats. As you remember, I said they, um, they also experienced declines in the 19th century, and they ended up in the far north of Scotland. And by the 1970s, actually, this picture hadn't really changed. Um, they probably, uh, there were more records further south than ever before, um, but they were still really um, only, only had a stronghold in Scotland. When you look at the distribution um, of wild cats in the 2000s, this survey was actually in 2008, the broad range extent hasn't really changed. But what has changed is our knowledge and understanding of the extent of interbreeding between wild cats and domestic cats, which are different species, but they do interbreed or hybridise and produce fertile offspring. These two pictures show you a domestic tabby and a wild cat, and it, has, it is distinctive from a domestic cat. It has a, a kind of broader head. Uh, bigger ears that are tufted and, uh, and typically a very uh, distinct kind of um, blunt ended black ended tail. The wild cat, what we do know now is that um, our wild cats in Scotland are among the most threatened of all of the European populations because of this extensive hybridisation and it, it, there are a lot of conservation efforts underway to both um, uh, neuter feral wild cats that are in the wild to prevent them from hybridising, but also captive breeding programmes to release purer animals back into the wild populations. You might be familiar with the pine martin because they've been in the press a lot in the last few years. At the end of um, the 19th century, the pine martin um, existed in the very far north of Scotland and there were some populations in Wales and the north of England and that really didn't change much by the 1970s. The pi pine martin is a lot slower to breed than polecats, they normally only have one or two kits a year. Fast forward to the 2010s, this map isn't great because um, there were actually no surveys in the far northwest of Scotland in this period. We do know they're still present here. And you can also see that pine martins have expanded their range. Uh, these were the results of releases, um, but they now are present pretty much through the whole of Scotland. And I think it was last year that for the first time, a pine martin uh, made its way into Northumberland, uh, in, into Kilda Forest, kind of entirely under its own steam. But in 2015, um, what, what had been found was that the populations that had existed in Wales and the north of England had completely died out. And this was because they just occurred at low density, the animals are slow to breed, and the, the populations just weren't able to survive. So the Vincent Wildlife Trust um, carried out a translocation programme, moving pine martins from Scotland to Wales to bring them back. So this is a pine martin that's been translocated from Scotland to Wales and it's currently waiting in its release pen where it stayed for a few weeks to get used to the local environment um, before it gets released into the forest in central Wales. It's wearing a radio collar so it can be monitored um, for up to a year after it's released. And the good news is that the pine martins in Wales are breeding successfully. So this is a mother wearing the radio collar with a kit who you can see is actually quite large already and uh, and there's a second translocation program underway to move pine martins to the forest of Dean this started last year and will carry on for the next couple of years so otters otters were doing quite well in the 19th century and actually continue to do quite well until the middle of the 20th century and then something very strange happened Hunting records, and this is, um, this is number of animals cited, were increasing until just after 1950. And then all of a sudden, the numbers declined dramatically. And the hunters raised concerns because they couldn't work out what was happening to our otters. Well, this was happening. Dieldrin, which is um, an insecticide used as a sheep dip and also coating on seed grain, was getting into the waterways, contaminating fish and killing our otters. So this shows the status in the 1970s. The black areas are where otters were known to be. The grey areas were where they were surveyed for. Um, and um, the white areas are where no surveys were carried out. And what you can see is that although 
uh, otters were pretty widely distributed still in Scotland, although not in the more industrial areas, and they were present in the kind of west of Wales. Actually, they were pretty much extinct from the whole of England, except for pockets of Cornwall, the far east of England, and on the Welsh borders. Once Dieldrin was banned, actually there was a really quick turnaround and otters have done a remarkable job of recolonising the country. There were some small translocations but actually very few and in the most recent National Otter Survey you can see they're pretty much present in all the counties of England which is really quite a remarkable turnaround. Foxes will be familiar to everybody and foxes actually have done pretty well, um, pretty well unaffected by uh, changes in the 19th century and done pretty well through the 20th century. This, is, um, this shows an index of fox numbers from 1960s uh, to 2010. But what is strange is that actually um, in the last 10 years, the British Trust for Ornithology have noticed a real decline in fox records. They survey for mammals as well as birds. Um, and at the same time, they've noticed severe declines in rabbit populations. Well, we knew rabbits were declining because of rabbit, ha rabbit hemorrhagic disease, which is a viral disease that um, has eradicated many rabbit populations across mainland Europe. Um, but it seems that there could be some link um, that's affecting fox populations. The other interesting thing about foxes in Britain is that urban fox numbers have really gone up in the last 50 years. And this is happening in Europe as well, but to a far lesser extent. It's something that seems to have happened more here. Stoats and weasels are our smallest carnivores and probably the coolest. Um, and um, as I've mentioned, um, they're very fertile breeders. So up until the 1960s, um, both seem to be doing pretty well and then rabbit populations crashed. Now in this country, stoats are pretty well obligate feeders on rabbits, which means they rely on them heavily for their prey. So when rabbit populations crashed in the late 50s, so did our stoat populations. But weirdly, because weasels rely on vole populations as voles are their main source of food, and rabbits eat the grass down, so it's too short for voles to flourish. When rabbit populations crashed, vole populations went up and so did weasels. So in 1960, we actually had a peak number of stoats, a, a low number of stoats and a peak number of weasels. And what we saw is rabbit populations recovered, stoat populations recovered, but weasel populations have tailed off. But that's probably a part of a normalizing process. The difficulty with these animals is they're an absolute pain in the bum to study. And that's because they don't leave any field signs. They are very ungrateful about you putting a radio collar on them. They get it off as soon as they can. And they move really quickly. And in this video, you can see a stoat, which has got this tufty black tail, having an altercation with a rat. And you can see just how tenacious and fast these little animals are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just love them. And that brings us to badgers, which are last but by no means least. So I did say that badgers had declined in the 19th century, and actually by the 1970s their numbers were still quite depressed on what we believed historical levels to be. And that was because activities like set blocking and set digging and badger baiting were still actually relatively popular. But in the 1970s, all of these activities were banned by law under the Protection of Badgers Act. And since then, we've seen a really remarkable increase in the number of badgers in this country. So in the 1980s, there were around 285,000 badgers. And by um, the 2010s, that number was increased to an estimate of about 500,000. Most recently, badgers have been associated with the bovine TB and the spread of that in cattle, which has led to state-sponsored culling to manage populations. But the good news for badgers is that in the last week, the government have announced that they're going to phase out the cull in England um, in preference for a vaccine. And that's obviously great news for our badger populations. So to summarise then, overall, it's a really good news story for Britain's carnivores, except for our wild cats, whose position continues to be precarious because of the extent of, of um, hybridisation with domestic cats. 
if the 19th century was about the decline of our carnivores and the 20th century was about recovery, then I think the next 100 years will be about seeing how we can coexist peacefully with them now that they're much more abundant and widespread than they've been for any time in the last 150 years. So that just reminds me to thank my supervisors for my PhD. And if you've got any questions. Our second to last talk is uh, brought to us by Maddie Ems, who will be talking about coral reef fishes in a changing climate. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming, um, especially if you've been here from the beginning. Um, impressive and great to see so many people. Um, so yeah, I'm from England, so how did I get involved in coral reef stuff? Well, I was kind of fascinated by marine biology in general, so I studied in Scotland, which obviously is slightly different water, um, and then they had an exchange system with students over in Australia, and we swapped, and once I stuck my head under the water over there, I thought, nope, that's it. <laughs> um, so I've been sort of working in and then coming back to studying coral reefs since then. Um, so I'm going to be talking a bit about coral reef fish populations today um, and how sort of their relationship with coral reefs um, means the, or how they're going to then cope with um, the claim changing climate that we're seeing now. So coral reefs, apart from being absolutely beautiful and fascinating, are also um, incredibly diverse ecosystems, um, particularly, for example, for populations of coral reef fishes, um, there's about uh, between four and 6,000 species um, across the whole world. Um, and some of these fish live in the corals and around the corals, and some have other relationships, such as they'll come for hunting or for reproduction, and they might spend other time out in the more open waters. Um, but they're a real hub. And we talk about the corals themselves as ecosystem engineers. So what they do is they're able to make these structures, which are then home to so many more animals. And how do they do that? Well, these huge structures are actually made from many, many, many of these tiny little polyps. And they're in the same family as the jellyfish, so they're cnidarians. So they kind of look like tiny upside down jellyfish. They even have stinging cells in their tentacles, just like jellyfish. And they can hunt for their own food as the plankton goes past. They can use their tentacles um, to get their own food. And um, as well as that, you can see that the tissue is kind of greenish, um, not in the translucent parts. But the other color comes from the fact that they have a symbiosis, so a positive relationship with a microalgae that lives within it. And the algae photosynthesizes and provides more energy to the coral, as well as the energy that it gets from its own food. So the combination of these two means that they're able to meet the demands or the, the high demands that are required to lay down the skeleton underneath, the calcium carbonate skeleton. And each of these polyps are connected to the neighboring polyp by a tissue layer. So you end up with this sort of covering, or so the top layer is alive, of these polyps, and then beneath that, they're building up this skeleton. And that's how, from a tiny little polyp, you end up with these huge structures that you can see from space. So they're really quite impressive. <clears throat> These are just some pictures of um, different coral types with different polyps. So um, the bit that you can actually see is actually the cup that the, that the polyp lives within. And the tissue is covering each of those cups. So on the left, they're a bit bigger, maybe two centimeters across each one. In the middle, these are about one centimeter, a bit smaller. And over here is a branching coral. And you can see the tiny dots on the surface. That's, um, those are all the little polyps. So they are really tiny, like millimeters. So just to show you a bit of a range. And actually, in the middle, you can just start to see the tentacles coming out. So at night, most corals tend to wait. Uh, and that's when, they're, that's when you start to see the polyp itself. However, this relationship with the algae uh, means that they're actually vulnerable to anthropogenic climate change. Because what happens is, as the waters start to increase in temperature, the corals get stressed, and they expel that algae. So what you're seeing when you see white corals is the tissue is still there, but it's translucent now. So you can see the white skeleton underneath. If the conditions are to improve, they can actually take other microalgae from the water back in, and they can recover. But if the conditions are to continue, 
they aren't able to meet those demands, those high energy demands, and so they die. And then you start to get sort of macroalgae like this growing over the tissue, and that's when you know that the coral is dead. So obviously, in the current situation, that means it's not very good news for the coral reefs. Um, but what does that mean if we're losing coral reefs for the coral reef fish populations that depend on them? So there have been some studies. Um, for example, before a bleaching event and after a bleaching event, they try to observe fishes, and maybe before a storm or after a big storm. But you're talking a small scale, so one location. But climate change is global, and the effects on the reef is going to be global. And we don't know at that kind of scale how the fish populations respond. So in order to try to predict this, we're going to go back in time to the Ice Age. Um, so where in the time period we're in at the moment, we have glacial cycles. So that amount of ice varies. So um, about 20,000 years ago, the ice was at its maximum, which means that the water level was at its lowest, because it's all taken up in the ice. Um, it was about 100 meters lower than now. So if we combine that with looking at the Red Sea, so this is Egypt on the left, you have Saudi Arabia on the right, uh, Yemen at the bottom. And you can see this, it's connected to the Indian Ocean just with one strip at the very bottom. And this is about 130 meters deep. So if we think back to when the sea level was 100 meters lower, you're talking almost completely closed. So it meant that the Red Sea was almost isolated and this did two things. So the first thing was it stopped the flow of water between the two. So it meant that with continued evaporation, it got really salty, which is another thing that stresses corals. So they think that we lost a lot of the coral reefs during this time. Um, in addition to that, or that means that during this period is a really good example of coral reef loss or habitat loss due to climate change. Um, and the other thing it gives us is a closed system, which in the marine environment to study what happens to the fishes that were there is really difficult because it's all so connected and so open compared to terrestrial systems. So this is a really good example. Um, so if we can figure out what happened during this example, we can potentially guess what might happen in the future and try to minimize the impact. Um, so how are we going to do that? Well, we can use population genetics. Um, but first, we need to sort of have a guess at what we think happened. So we're going to focus only on the species that only live in the Red Sea, so they're endemic to the Red Sea. And we look at, if we look at the split time, so the divergence from a common ancestor that was more wider ranging was more than 20,000 years ago. So that makes us think that instead of when they lost the coral reefs in that area, being eliminated from the Red Sea and then coming back in later, we think they did actually stay in the Red Sea in little pockets of refugia. So little pockets of in the very north and very south where we think coral reefs were able to continue. However, even though they were able to stay there, you can imagine with such a big loss of the rest of the reef system that that's a huge crash in population numbers and therefore also genetic variation. So we might see what we call a genetic bottleneck. So this is a scenario we think we have. So we had our population before, and then at some event, which in this case was probably the uh, loss of the habitat when the ice age was at its maximum, we went down to a much smaller population. And then now we know that they've recovered because they're still there. We see them when we're diving. But what we want to try to do is figure out how small this population got that was subsequently able to recover. So we can do this by looking at diversity in the population. So if we imagine our original population, I'm sort of using colors here, but um, to be quite diverse. And then if we were to just pick a small number of them and then try to recreate the population from that, we're going to end up with a lot less diversity. Uh, in the same way, if we select still a smaller number, but maybe a bit more, then we end up with more diversity than the other situation, but less than we had originally. So that's what we look for, um, diversity patterns. So now we need our data. What is the diversity patterns of 
the populations that are there. So I went out into the field and caught the fish of different species so we could see how it maybe affected different um, sort of species with different niches, species with different behaviors. Um, I took a little piece of tissue and then released them again so they can swim off on their happy way. Um, and yeah, then we ext extracted the DNA from those tissue samples and sent them for sequencing. And then we can use those sequences to figure out genetic diversity to try to estimate that smallest size of population that we know is able to recover. So this is a work in progress. This is my PhD project, effectively. So we know that they were able to recover that small population, um, which has great implications for conservation. Um, if we think about the populations that are remaining in currently degraded areas, for example, we can find out or we can estimate from that minimum number whether we think that population is capable of recovering or not. If it's not, we might have to, for example, do some coral restoration, um, so sort of coral farming and then outplanting, um, potentially even bringing in or reseeding fish populations. But maybe there's populations that could recover, in which case they would need different kind of management, like maybe uh, zones of um, protection, such as no fishing. And these kind of numbers of what that minimum size was will allow us to sort of design the size of those areas rather than just guessing how many fish are needed, how many do we have to protect. So yeah, I'd just like to thank uh, my supervisors. Um, this is one of the institutes that um, I studied at. The coral reef is right here and mountains right there. So it's a really impressive um, environment and to say thank you very much for listening and I hope to tell you the results at some point. <laughs> okay, our final speaker for today is Anna Guasco with From Devilfish to Friendly Whale, Stories of the Grey Whale. All right, hi everyone. Um, thank you for staying until the end. My name is Anna Guasco. I'm a PhD student and Gates Scholar in the Department of Geography. Um, and I'll just preface this by saying that my research is not actually zoological scientific research, I look at stories. So I look at stories specifically about gray whales. Um, so when all of you came into the museum today, you walked under a very large whale skeleton. I'm guessing you remember that. Gray whales are not as big as that, but they generally look a lot like that whale. That whale is a fin whale. Um, and one way that they're similar is that they are filter feeders. So generally, whales and dolphins are divided into two categories. Um, of the infraorder cetacea. Cetaceans make up toothed whales and non-toothed whales. My whales are in the non-toothed whales category and they're filter feeders. So they use baleen, which is kind of like these large combs that hang down from the top of their mouth to eat. Um, and one fun fact about the whales that I study is that they're actually really well known for being among the grossest of filter feeding whales. They uh, turn onto their sides and go to the seafloor and shovel up whatever they can find. And so you can actually see them coming back up to the surface with big old sort of mud plumes, as they're called, dribbling out the sides of their mouths. Uh, so they're, they're very gross whales. They live um, in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this map is from the uh, US federal government, so I do apologize for how US-centric it is. Um, they do go to places besides the US. Um, the ones that I study are specifically in this region here, all along the west coast of North America, which is the eastern North Pacific, so the eastern part of the ocean. Gray whales also exist in the western North Pacific. This is considered a separate subpopulation of one overall species, but they do interbreed. They also used to exist out here over in the Atlantic, but they went extinct in the 18th century, so I will not be talking about that. Mine specifically, the ones that go in this area, have the longest migration of any marine mammal, although there are a few individual humpbacks that give them a run for their money. As a general, the species has the longest migration. And one thing that they're very well known for is that they stay really, really, really close to the coast. So a lot of times when you think about save the whale and whale conservation, we're thinking about animals that live lives that are not very connected with humans. They're sort of out there in the middle of nowhere in the oceans. No one really sees them, interacts with them. But gray whales are interacting with people in coastal communities throughout their entire range. And that means that people have had very different relationships with them uh, throughout time and even to today. And one of those relationships that I study 
is what I call the conservation narrative of the gray whale. And the starting point of this is devil fish. In the 19th century, gray whales were called the devil fish, among other names, uh, by American and British as well as Russian whalers. And they were called the devil fish specifically because whenever whalers would try to hunt them, they were well known for ramming boats, attacking whalers, flipping over boats, Men would get injuries, even sometimes lose their lives trying to hunt these whales. And particularly ferocious were the mothers. Uh, so this sort of idea of the devilfish mother turning around and charging the boat and her baby being the, the sort of object of her protection emerges out of the narratives of whaling in the 19th century. And the image that I have here, um, I just find a bit entertaining because it's very romantic seeming. It's sort of idyllic. It looks like this maritime scene, and it's uh, from the opening pages of whaling captain Charles Melville Scammon, um, his book on the marine mammals of North America, which from as far as I can tell is about the earliest time that we see this usage of devilfish. It's in the mid-19th century, and it depicts a whaling scene in California lagoons, and these lagoons are specifically in Mexico, in Baja California Sur. Uh, there are four lagoons that the gray whales used to breed in. These lagoons are well known for being um, a bit more shallow, a bit more protected and warm. And the reason that gray whales most likely give birth in these lagoons is that they're protected from their main predators, which are orcas or killer whales. Orcas and killer whales can't attack adult gray whales, but they can go for the babies. So these are, seen, these are places that for gray whales once were uh, very safe and protected, uh, but in the 19th century, large industrial whaling ships started following them into the lagoons, and that's the scene that's depicted here. So they earned the name devilfish because of their tendency to protect themselves. Just a little ironic. Um, the devilfish sort of retained that name a little bit um, in the next century, but due to international conservation efforts, new regulations, um, in association with other conservation efforts for whales across the whole world, the devilfish began to be a bit more protected, um, but that name didn't entirely get lost until it became the friendly whale, which is about as opposite as you can possibly get from devilfish to the friendly whale or la ballena amistrosa. The friendly whale was first documented around 1970 in one of the lagoons that previously had been a site of 19th century whaling. Um, and depending on which version of the story you look at, uh, the first friendly whale encounter was either uh, from a local fisherman or from uh, U.S. marine biologists. I generally would say that the fisherman story is probably more accurate, but also the way that you tell the story sort of depends on what particular version you're trying to uh, get across. The way that the friendly whale became the friendly whale was, uh, as legend has it, that a fisherman named Pachico Mayoral who lived in San Ignacio, on San Ignacio Lagoon in Baja, Mexico, was out in his small boat called a panga. Uh, it looks sort of just like a, it's a little bit like a punting boat, actually, uh, about that size. He was out fishing, and a gray whale started to approach his boat. And he had heard these stories about the devil fish, and so he was terrified. He thought he was going to get rammed. This whale was going to try to attack him. And instead, the whale just popped up next to the boat and seemed to be kind of looking at him. And it stayed around long enough and seemed to be curious enough that he eventually ended up reaching out and touching the whale, and it let him pet it. From there, Pacheco Mayoral started an entire whale watching industry in Laguna San Ignacio, and now thousands of tourists from across Mexico, the states, and further afield go to three lagoons in Baja, Mexico to touch and pet gray whales. Gray whale watching uh, is present in other parts of the range, but U.S. Uh, federal regulations as well as Canadian federal regulations do not allow you to get as close to the whales nor pet them. So uh, the friendly whale phenomenon seems to really officially only happen in the lagoons of Mexico. These are just a few more photos of the friendly whale. So this is how close they get. And people will even uh, sometimes pet their baleen and things like that. Uh, whether or not that's a good idea for the whales is a whole different question. And I can get more into that in the question section if anyone is interested in that. But what I would like to get to is looking at gray whales, why look at stories? So I just told you about this really interesting example of 
what marine biologists and conservation bi biologists might call charismatic megafauna, uh, or in more vernacular, really cute big things. <laughs> um, why look at stories and not look at the physiology or look at the economics of whale watching and so on? And all of those things are really important. But what I'm interested in is when we tell a story like from devilfish to friendly whale, what does that do in society? How and why does that matter? How does that affect policy? How does it affect conservation decision making, local economies, the tourism industry, social justice, and more? And moreover, whose stories are being heard? In the sort of standard narrative of From Devilfish to Friendly Whale, who's the narrator here? Are there other stories that are being left out? And when particular bodies um, like conservation organizations or governments tell this story, uh, whose voices are being heard and whose voices aren't being heard? And that gets us to one of the central sort of aims of my own research, which is what other stories might we tell? Can we tell more stories? And most importantly, can we tell stories that help us shape a more just and sustainable future? That's it. Thank you to all of our presenting scientists and conservationists and to you for listening. If you would like to explore more stories from women in science and conservation, the Museum of Zoology International Women's Day labels will be available via our website. Thank you. <laughs>